Just like to say in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I just want to welcome you as we come to spend a little time in reflection this evening. We're going to spend a little time listening to Sunday's Gospel and reflecting. We maybe just begin by praying the Our Father together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And so we recognize that we come into the presence of God and in doing so, we just ask God to to give us that moment in which we allow ourselves to listen to what God wants us to hear. As we just ask God for that grace, just to push everything aside to, in a sense, to empty our minds so that we can really listen to him. As we just sit in silence for a moment or two, just letting go of everything. And so now we're going to listen to God's word. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness and he remained there for 40 days and was tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts and the angels looked after him. After John had been arrested, Jesus went into Galilee. There he proclaimed the good news from God. The time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Normally, I would go away each year for a week or so and retreat. It has been what Pope Francis would describe as a stoppage time, a time to stop and take stock. I find it refreshing and energizing. It gives me the chance to rest and switch off. However, it tends to be a challenging time because it gives me the space to see where where I have started to drift away from God's desire for me. In his book, Let Us Dream, Pope Francis describes a stoppage time as a good time for sifting, for reviewing the past, for remembering with gratitude who we are, reviewing the past, what has been given and where we have gone astray. In every person's stoppage, what is revealed is what needs to change, our lack of internal freedom, the idols we have been serving, the ideologies we have tried to live by, the relationships we have neglected. What is the fruit of this COVID stoppage? I would say patience sprinkled with a healthy sense of humor, which allows us to endure and make space for change to happen. All of us might describe this time of the coronavirus as an enforced stoppage time. And so it might be a value to make time to reflect back over the last year, to sift, to review, and to remember with gratitude and to see where we have gone astray. A starting point for me would be my birthday, which is almost a year ago. It was on a Friday. It's a day I remember well. Early in the morning, I received a phone call to tell me that my cousin, Roisin, had died. Her brothers and sisters came to St. Columbus for Mass. Afterwards, I invited them into the house for tea and coffee and a place to chat. I couldn't do that today. It rained hard all day. From St. Columbus, I went to a meeting in Paisley. I was soaked by the time I arrived. From there, I went to the West End of Glasgow, to the Oran Moor, to watch a play with my niece, Neve. It was written by Katrina Dugan, an English teacher at Trinity High. And it was brilliant. We laughed and we cried. In the evening, my mum and I met some friends for dinner at an Italian restaurant. It was a full day, one in which I experienced sadness and laughter and joy. And then within a month, life had completely changed for every one of us and has become dominated by the coronavirus pandemic and COVID-19. Such days can't happen now though hopefully it will not be too long before they can be experienced again. Last year on the 23rd of March, we entered into a lockdown which we have yet to fully leave. 
Our vocabulary now contains everyday words which we would have rarely used. Coronavirus, COVID, pandemic, virus, lockdown, and vaccine. The Louisa Jordan was a concert and exhibition center. Now it's a vaccine center and a hospital in waiting. This last year has been and continues to be a struggle, bringing into sharp focus what is good and what is not so good. It's a struggle that is played out externally, on one hand in the way in which we may have time to slow down, read more, become more observant, and aware of the beauty of creation. And on the other hand, the way in which we are no longer able to see friends, go out for a drink or a meal, or to watch a movie. It's also played out interiorly, on one hand, in the way we have managed loneliness or isolation or feelings of anxiety and fear through our inner strength, positivity and faith. And on the other hand, the way in which we can feel overwhelmed by the same loneliness, isolation and fear. In some ways, we might describe this year as an extended time in the wilderness, one which might help us to enter more deeply into the wilderness experience of Jesus. Immediately before Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, we know that Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit had descended upon him. Pope Benedict describes the descending of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus as his anointing as the Christ, the Messiah. Yet, as Pope Benedict points out, as soon as Jesus is anointed, the same Spirit drives him into the desert. We might ask why. Is it in some way to prepare him to fulfill his mission? Pope Benedict writes, from now on, he is charged with this commission. The three synoptic gospels tell us, much to our surprise, that the Spirit's first command leads him into the desert to be tempted by the devil. The action is prefaced by interior struggle, and this recollection is also inevitably an inner struggle for fidelity to the task, a struggle against all distortions to the task that can claim to be its true fulfillment. It's a descent into the perils besetting humankind, for there is no other way to lift up fallen humanity. Jesus has, has to enter the drama of human existence, for that belongs to the core of his mission. He has to penetrate it completely, down to his uttermost depths, in order to find the lost sheep, to bear it upon his shoulders and to bring it home. These words of Pope Benedict echo those of the author of the letter to the Hebrews. Since all the children share the same blood and flesh, Christ too shared equally in it, so that by his death they could take away all the power of the devil, the one who had power over death, and set free all those who had been held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it was not the angels that he took to himself. He took to himself descent from Abraham. It was essential that he should in this way become completely like his brothers and sisters so that he could be a compassionate and trustworthy high priest of God's religion, able to atone for human sins. That is because he has himself been through temptation. He is able to help others who are tempted. And so Jesus, anointed by the Holy Spirit, receives his commission, not only to proclaim repentance to sinners, but to bring them salvation from the consequences of their sins. It's only by experiencing the depth of temptation which all humanity experiences that Jesus is able to bring them home to the Father. And so we find Jesus being driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. The wilderness experience for, is for Jesus an external mas manifestation of the internal struggle with temptation. We recall that in the creation story, Adam and Eve are firstly placed in the Garden of Eden. 
This is the place of harmony, paradise. Many of us will have a place which we consider as paradise. It might be a particular location where we return either physically or in our minds. It might be an experience or an image which conjures up a feeling of total peace, harmony, and joy. And yet, for Adam and Eve, even in paradise, they were, cannot, they were not completely safe from temptation. And as we all know, unfortunately, they gave way to the temptations of the serpent. As a consequence, they find themselves banished into the wilderness. It's in the wilderness that humanity constantly struggles with temptation and constantly falls into sin. Pope Francis writes, We are born beloved creatures of our creator, God of love, into a world that has lived long before us. We belong to God and to one another. We are part of creation. How are we to be persuaded otherwise? How did we become blind to the preciousness of creation and the fragility of humanity? How did we forget the gifts of God and of each other? How to explain that we live in a world where nature is suffocated, where virus is spread like wildfire, and bring down our societies, where heartbreaking poverty coexists with inconceivable wealth, and where entire people like the Rohingya are consigned to the dust heap. Our sin, Pope Francis says, lies in failing to recognize value in wanting to possess and exploit that which we do not value as a gift. Sin always has the same root of possessiveness, of enrichment at the expense of other people and creation itself. It is the same sinful mindset we are discussing in relation to abuse. Sin is a rejection of the limits that love requires. The Holy Spirit in driving Jesus into the wilderness requires that he will struggle with temptation that we as individuals and as a people struggle with and as history and the present day demonstrate or too clearly have given in to. Jesus, of course, though tempted, does not give way to sin. In just a couple of lines, St. Mark describes Jesus' struggle with temptation as a battle in which we have the Holy Spirit on one side and Satan on the other, wild beasts on one side and angels on the other. Jesus, though, didn't come into this world simply to experience temptation, but to overcome the consequences of sin, which drove into and keeps humanity in the wilderness. Jesus came to bring hope, that we need not be seduced by the temptations we face in our lives, overcome to be crushed by sin, but rather he came to bring us forgiveness so that reconciled with God and with creation and with one another, we may experience a deep and enjoying peace and joy. And so, having experienced the wilderness, Jesus is ready for his mission which he begins immediately, as St. Mark tells us. After John had been arrested, Jesus went into Galilee. There he proclaimed the good news from God. The time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Galilee is where Jesus was to carry out most of his public ministry, It's where, as St. Luke tells us, that Mary and Joseph returned after being purified and consecrating Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem. And so Galilee is the region where Jesus grew up. And he would have been familiar with the countryside as well as with the towns and villages. It's where he was most at home. Maybe this is why he chose to minister here among his own people. Who knows? St. Mark marks the moment in which John's ministry comes to a climax with his arrest and his subsequent death at the hands of Herod. 
and the moment in which the ministry of Jesus begins. Three years or so later, Jesus' ministry will reach its climax with his arrest and subsequent death and resurrection, while marking the beginning of the ministry of his disciples and of the church. It's interesting that John the Baptist remained all the time in the wilderness by the banks of the Jordan. He didn't go out to the people proclaiming his message. Rather, the people came to him. They came to listen to him. They were enthralled by his preaching. And as a consequence, they repented for the times they gave way to temptation. They received his baptism as a sign of their repentance, hoping to have their sins forgiven. John's mission was to prepare the way for Jesus, and he trusted that he was to carry out this mission by remaining in the wilderness. Jesus, however, is dynamic in his ministry. He is to go out to the people, and so he does not stay in one place, but rather he goes to where the people are, in their towns and villages, to the places where they struggle in life, where they experience sin and temptation. The message that John and Jesus preach is the same. The time has come. The kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. The message is the same but different because with Jesus, the kingdom is not only coming. It is not only near at hand. It is here embodied in Jesus himself. And salvation is coming. And it is already here in the person of Jesus, for he is the saviour of all humanity and all creation. This year, as we begin Lent, we may have already decided on sacrifices or penances that we will attempt to do over the next 40 days or so. However, as I said earlier, It seems that we really began our penances and sacrifices 11 months ago because every day we are being asked to make sacrifices and to carry out penances, such as staying at home, having no physical contact with people we love, and missing out on the simple pleasures like meeting friends for a beer or a glass of wine or coffee. And this can, for many of us, be a real struggle, and it would only be too easy to to give in to the temptations of meeting up with friends and family or traveling a distance to be to some favorite hill or beauty spot or go to work when we've been in contact with someone who has tested positive for the coronavirus. And it would only be too easy to judge those who find themselves succumbing to temptation. But let's not. Maybe this Lent, we can choose to spend a little more time with Jesus in his struggles and invite him to share in ours. Maybe we can spend a little bit more time listening to his preaching, his healing and his forgiving. And in doing so, we may find that this Lent becomes a time to be replenished and energized and a time that will fill us with hope and peace and joy. And so let's listen to the reading from the Gospel once again. And as we listen, let us ask ourselves, what is it that God is asking of us? And what is it that God decides for us? The Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness, and he remained there for 40 days, and was tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels looked after him. And John, after John had been arrested, Jesus went into Galilee. There he proclaimed the good news from God. The time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And so we just pause now, in silence for a moment or two. And we conclude by praying together. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And have a good evening, and keep safe. <laughs>